So, Revelation chapter 2, we're going to continue in our series, The Seven Churches of Revelation. If you're a first-time guest with us, uh, I'm Mike Drury. I'm the lead pastor here. Glad to have you with us, whether you're joining in person or joining us online. And uh, we are excited about what God is doing through this series. It's a good series. It's a challenging series. And it's important to remember that this is a, th these are letters, individual letters from Jesus to his bride. Have you ever written a love letter to your spouse? Written a letter to your spouse? Like, that's in essence what Jesus is doing here. And he loves his bride so much. And his bride is the church. But also notice Jesus is a big proponent of the local church. Can I say that again? Jesus is a big proponent of the local church. You say, well, no, it's just the, the, the big C church. It's the church all around the world. Is right. Absolutely. But if he was not a proponent of the local church and didn't care what was going on locally within his bride, why does he write to churches that are in localized regions? Why didn't he just write one big letter to the church? And again, in essence, that's what this is. But in this particular portion of Revelation, he is writing to local churches because God cares about his church globally and God cares about his church locally. I say that because there are some people that are sort of drifting away from the idea of the local church, and it's not important to be involved in a local church. It's not that big a deal. Just so long as you're a part of the big, big C church, that's all that Jesus cares about. And I'm saying from the beginning of the establishment of the church, the big C global church has been put forth and planted through local churches. And that's just how God rolls and how Jesus has chosen to operate. So we're proponents of the local church. So you know what? When we plant churches, we don't just plant a global church. We plant local churches in cities where we feel like the Spirit has shown us, I am at work, I am involved, come join me here. Come join what I am already doing in this city. And that's been God's plan from the initiation in the book of Acts, that Paul went to cities and preached the gospel, made disciples, planted churches, established elders, and then wrote letters to encourage, to affirm, to rebuke, to uplift, and to direct those local churches that are all a part of the Big C Church. There's a little bit of ecclesiology for you right there. All right, so today's, today's letter is to the church of Thyatira. Thyatira. So here's what I would like to do in a second. Uh, we're going to read through this entire passage, and then I want to go back, and I want to break it down, and we'll look at the aspects that Jesus gives us. Now, a couple of things right before we, we read, so you have this in your mind about the city. Thyatira was the smallest of the seven churches and of the seven cities. It was, a number of commentators believed, from a city standpoint, not a church standpoint, but from a city standpoint, the least influential city of the seven churches that are written of in that region. In fact, Pliny the Elder dismissed Thyatira, quote, as a city of no great importance. It had no palaces, no universities. Unlike Pergamum, the city we looked at last week, I didn't even say this, Pergamum boasted a library of over 200,000 volumes of books, scrolls. There was no university in this city. There was no large, massive temple to Caesar. It was a town that was full of trade guilds. You could literally say these were the precursor to what we now know as unions. This was a blue-collar town. Thyatira was a blue-collar town. It was famous for one particular thing. Dye. It was famous for the production of of dye and clothing that represent. In particular, this was the place to buy colored clothing. And purple colored clothing in particular. Purple dye, again, I'm just reading and, and, and understanding in my knowledge just with research, but purple dye was hard to come by in this day and age. And this town was known for it. And they manufactured a lot of it and shipped it out all over the region. By the way, fun fact, side note, nothing spiritual. Purple's my favorite color. <laughs> so what is word? <laughs> Thank you for clapping for me. <laughs> I 
feel the love on that one. So listen, as I, as I was reading that, I'm like, oh, wait, hang on. Purple, purple clothing. I, I'm familiar with the scriptures. That's ringing a bell to me. All right, so let me go. Um, when you think of purple and purple clothing, it may ring a bell with some of you of a person from the scripture who was known to be a businesswoman who dealt in purple dye and purple clothing, right? Lydia in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, where Paul planted a church. In fact, listen to this statement about her. Acts 16, 14. One of those listening, when Paul came to preach the gospel and he goes to the place of prayer and there were women gathered by a river, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth or purple clothing. She was a worshiper of God. She understood about God, but the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Lydia in Acts 16, who really was, was one of the founding members of the church at Philippi, was from Thyatira. A number of commentators believe that she may have very well been influential in going back to her hometown in Thyatira and helping to plant the church there. There's no biblical record of that, so that's just some thoughts and ideas. But certainly you see the context there. That's about this particular city of Thyatira. Least, smallest of the cities, longest letters, longest letter, strongest rebuke. Smallest city, longest letter, strongest rebuke. So let's look at what does Jesus say to his church in the city of Thyatira. I read in verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. There's the approval. Here's the accusation. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You, I notice this word, tolerate. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Who? there's something deep here who calls herself, notice that, Jesus didn't, but she calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads, some translations have the word seduces, she misleads my servants, Jesus says, into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Here's the admon admonition. Remember? Approval, accusation, admonition. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, in other words, the ones who have not followed Jezebel's false teaching, I say to you, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except, notice this, to hold on to what you have until I come. Be faithful. Don't give in. Don't give up. Stay true. Hold on. And then at the end, the promise. To the one who is victorious, the individual, so he's, again, we've said all along, this is both corporate and individual. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star, Jesus himself. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen, and God bless the reading of his word. All right, so a couple of brief thoughts. Let's move through this and then prepare our hearts for communion today. Verse 18, again, we said that each one of these letters that Jesus writes, because this is about Jesus, it involves the church, but it is about Jesus. 
the, the letter is bookended with a picture of and a promise from. So the picture of that Jesus gives to each one of the churches is not random. It is very particular to what is going on in the church and what he is calling the church out and calling them up to. So the picture that Jesus gives of himself to the church at Thyatira is this. First of all, the Son of God. Interestingly enough, this is the only place where we see Jesus directly referring to himself as the Son of God. He, has re he, he, he refers to himself and speaks to himself as being God, from God. He is God. But typically, the name that he gave himself was the Son of Man. But here in this letter, he says to the church, I am the son of God. That's intentional. That's not just, uh, oh, just let me remind you that I'm divine. I am divinity. There's a reason why. And he says that he's the son of God. So what he's speaking to is his divine authority. We would be wise to remember what we believe the teaching from Scripture is, is that Jesus Christ, when he entered this world, he was already divinity. He was already God. And as God, he wrapped himself in human flesh and became human. So Jesus was fully God and fully man. He never lost his divinity. He is the divine son of God. Why was this important to the church? Here in Thyatira... The primary emphasis or teaching of worship involved the god Apollo or Apollos. And Apollo was the offspring or the, listen, the son of a small g god, Zeus. Zeus was sort of the apex of the Greek uh, mythology gods. And Apollo was his son. So Jesus said, while you may be in a city that recognizes and even worships a son of a supposed God, I'm telling you that I am the son of God. He is declaring his divine authority and his supreme divinity over any small g God that would try and raise itself up against him. You see the picture there? Jesus said, I am the son of God. He goes on to say, I have eyes like blazing fire. What is this speaking of? In essence, what Jesus is saying to the church then and to the church today is that with eyes of blazing fire, I have the capacity to see and discern not just your actions, but I have the capacity to see beyond the action to actually get to the heart of the matter, to see the intent, and even to see the motive behind the deeds and the actions that are taking place. It's a discernment and a revelation through the eyes of fire. And then his feet like burnished bronze. And again, when we see sort of the, uh, the judgment that gets meted out, that's what he's speaking of. It was speaking of his power to judge. His divine authority, his discerning knowledge and wisdom, and his demonstration of power to judge rightly and purely anything that would try and raise itself up against Jesus Christ himself. All right, are you with me so far? Okay, verse 19, here's the approval. Here's what he approved the church of. Jesus praised them for their deeds, their love and faith, their service, and then for persevering through all of it. So four primary things, and then that they persevere while they are doing these things. Deeds, love, faith, and service. And there is a difference between deeds and service that I want to unpack. Real quick, just it's important to know. Deeds. These were the individual works that the followers of Jesus in Thyatira were doing for Jesus. It's important to know, again, with the eyes of fire, the discernment of the why behind the what. And Jesus speaks to this, right? If we're not careful, we can whittle following Jesus down to a set of do's and don'ts. Pharisaical legalism. Let me set up a system of boxes that I can check to say, I follow Jesus because I go to church. I read my Bible today. I gave my tithe. Uh, I did this. And there's nothing behind it. And our, our motives and our heart and our intent can be wrong. And so what Jesus says is, I see your deeds. They're wonderful. But here's why. Because of your love and your faith. 
what they did for Jesus was driven by and came out of the love that they had for him and that had been poured into them by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. So they were not doing what they did for Jesus to earn, uh, to earn his love and to earn his favor, but rather they did what they did for Jesus because of his love and because of who he called them to be. There's a big difference, right? Following Jesus is not a performance-based relationship. If you've ever been in a relationship that was performance-based, that's one of the most awful places to be, is it not? You're always trying to measure up. You never know quite where you stand. And the moment you don't perform, get ready. Here comes the judge. But Jesus is saying, I see your deeds, but I see the love that you have for me that drives what you do for me. I see the faith that you have in me that helps you better receive and understand and walk in the love that I have for you. This is important for us today. We preach this often. I've preached this often, and I will as long as I continue to lead Pine Hills Church. This is so important that what we believe determines how we behave. If we believe that we are deeply loved, if we believe that we are undeserving, but God in his immense grace, mercy, and love saved us, called us, empowered us, and now walks with us with his grace and his mercy over us, then we will behave as dearly loved, grace-filled, grace-washed over, mercy-filled people as the Son of God, from the Son of God, like that. If we think like we are constantly in a relationship of trying to please and, and perform for him so that he won't be angry with us, that is destructive. And Satan has a heyday with that. Faith and love. Faith in God and love for God produces genuine works for God. In fact, I was just really processing this. Well, let me draw a distinction between works and service because there is. I think this is beautiful. So the works are the individual works that these, these men and women, these people were doing in this church. What is this word service? It's different. The Greek word for service is diakonian, which means ministry. It's used of the collective ministry of the church as a whole. So Jesus is like, I see your individual deeds that you're doing in your daily life. I also see the corporate work that you're doing as a church in this city. Boy, if that isn't paramount and important for us, even as we talk about Engage My City today. That God sees every one of our individual works and with eyes of fire and love, he discerns them and he discerns our motive and our heart and the desires behind it. But so he does for us as a church collectively. And we've said often, this city, the city of Fort Wayne, should be better off because Pine Hills Church is here and because Pine Hills Church carries the gospel of Jesus in the heart of Jesus. And that's what he said to the church. I praise you for your individual deeds and for your collective service or your collective ministry as a church. They are true. They're motivated by love. Your faith in me is growing. Your love for me is deepening. And your works individually and collectively, they're pure. They're good fruit. You know, there's a big difference between eating good fruit and the sweet savor and eating fruit when it's gone bad. And it's nasty. And Jesus like, if I may, I'm tasting your fruit and it's sweet. What a compliment, right? What high praise for this church. I would say this. While he speaks about quantity, he talks about that last. He talks about quality first. So I would say it's always quality over quantity. It's not about I got to do more, I got to do more. No, it's like how do I walk in deeper relationship? And the deeper the roots of their faith, the deeper the roots of our faith, the deeper the relationship of their love, the deeper the relationship of our love, the more fruitful their works became, the more fruitful our works become. We don't chase after more, we chase after him. <laughs> Come on now, it's July 4th. I know you were up late last night because your neighbors started shooting off fireworks early. Your dogs are freaking out. I know. 
Come on, don't go to sleep. Like, this is, this is from Jesus. Amen. This is a good encouragement and a good challenge for us today. Because some of you, without proper teaching, new to the faith, coming to faith, you just more and more, more chase after more works. I got to do this. I got to do that. I'm saying, hold on, sister. Step back, brother. Pursue Jesus. And the deeper you walk with Jesus, the more fruitful your works will be. So let's chase after Jesus and not after the works, right? And let's make sure that when we do the works, that the motivation behind them is because we love Jesus and we believe Jesus. <laughs> That's the call. That's a good word. We could stop right there, Derek. And just call an invitation right there. But Jesus had something against the church. I ask myself every church, so I sit down and read, God, what would you say about Pine Hills? What would be your approval what would be your accusation? What would you call us to? And we should also be asking that, I think, even as individuals. And again, the accusation is not a condemning one. It's born from a heart of love because Jesus loves his bride. Right? So here's the accusation. Verse 20. I'm not going to read it again, but they tolerate. Listen, they tolerated. They tolerated Jezebel and her false teachings. This is the accusation against us. Now, this bears taking a minute or two for some explanation because this may or may not be familiar to you. There's all different types of thoughts and teaching, and so uh, I just want to try and provide some understanding to give us a basic understanding what exactly is Jesus. What? Who is this Jezebel? Is it a real person? Is it a spirit? What, what, what all is he mentioning here? So here, here's, here's what we do know, Okay. So there was obviously a woman in the church. Jesus said, that woman. So there was a woman in the church who claimed of herself to be a prophet. Jesus said, I never claimed she was, but she claims of herself to be a prophet. She was very influential with her teachings and even some of these false prophecies. And we do know she had acquired a following in the church. If you paid attention, Jesus not only speaks about her, but he speaks about those who follow or commit adultery with her. Those are the followers who have embraced her teaching and then who are living out their life according to her teaching. Through these teachings, she led individuals from the church. This is important to know as we talk about Jezebel and either the, the, the Jezebel spirit or the spirit of Jezebel, whatever. Like, this is important that she led individuals from the church into sexual immorality and idolatry. The two eyes, immorality and idolatry. Uh, interesting, uh, it, it struck my attention that these two same things were talked about in the previous church last week. Only idolatry was listed first. But here with Jezebel, it's the sexual immorality that was listed first. And I think that's intentional. Because she, th this... This teaching, this spirit behind, whatever, it is a seducing spirit. That's why, that's why some of the translations will actually use the word she seduces. Uh, was her name really Jezebel? Was there a woman in Thyatira who named Jezebel? I asked my own question. This is not biblical. Who in the world would name their daughter Jezebel? <laughs> Maybe. And if you're Jezebel here today, praise God. No, no. <laughs> No judgment. No judgment. It's just with what's the thought process that's associated with Jezebel. There is a, there's a variety of thoughts. I, I've read extensively trying to dig into this, right? So a couple of them. Um, there's a very, very small few that say, yeah, that, like, that was actually her name. Believe it or not. Like there's a woman in the church named Jezebel. Uh, even smaller few think th this was the name of the pastor's wife. And I, I just thought, if I show up as a guest to a church, and the pastor gets up one day, and he's talking, he says, you know what, I, I'm just so thankful for my wife, Jezebel, and all she's, I'd probably be the last time I ever attended that church. I don't, <laughs> there's just something associated with Jezebel. Mm. Majority of commentators believe that Jesus mentions the name Jezebel because he was referring to the Old Testament Queen Jezebel, who was the wife of King Ahab. 
that the woman's name wasn't necessarily Jezebel, but by using the name, there was an instant name recognition to those who would hear about this. In other words, listen to this. In other words, this woman was acting either in and or with the spirit of Jezebel. Okay? The spirit of Jezebel. The characteristics, the impact, and perhaps even the spirit behind the first Jezebel was at play in this particular woman and her followers in Thyatira. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Okay, there's a few people. All right. Um, let me, let's talk for a moment, like, who is this Jezebel? Maybe, maybe that will bring some more clarity as well, too. Um, there are many who believe there is a specific Jezebel spirit. A demonic spirit that shows consistent behavior similar to that of the wicked Jezebel may very well be true. I'm just cautious about being incredibly dogmatic when there's lots of uncertainty. So it's, it's possible. It's very possible. The Bible doesn't name a spirit called Jezebel. But Jesus here certainly implies at the very least that this woman was operating like in the spirit of or with similar characteristics like Jezebel. Regardless of that, what she teaches and how she influences and seduces God's people, that is demonic. That is not of Jesus, right? That is not of Jesus. So, in 1 Kings 18 and 19, we're not going to take time to read. Note takers, if you want to go back and refresh this, you could read all about Queen Jezebel in the Old Testament in 1 Kings 18 and 19. Here's a brief summary. Jezebel was married to King Ahab of Israel, an incredibly wicked king. She was the daughter of a priest of the cult, Baal. That was her beginnings and her upbringing and what she was exposed to from an early age. Baal was a wicked god of some of the enemies of Israel. Worshiping him included various forms of sexual perversion and even child sacrifice. Imme now listen to this. Immediately when Jezebel became queen... She intentionally sought out the prophets of the Lord and had them put to death. She then went on a nationwide purge of Israel's worship of Jehovah and replaced even the very altar and altars with sacrifices to Baal. So you could summarize what we see in 1 Kings 18 and 19. She attacked the leaders of God. She silenced the voice of God. And she corrupted the worship of God. That's about as succinct as I can give it to you that we see there. There's a second instance. By the way, when Elijah had the prophets uh, of Baal, 400 of them or so, from when he just blew them away and God rained fire down on Mount Carmel on the sacrifice and proved God was God and Baal was not. And he had like the prophets of Baal killed. Like, should God, there will be no... She immediately threatened the prophet of God. And listen, this woman, this spirit, like brought such fear on the man of God that he feared for his life. He took off. He went. He ran. He hid. And he asked God, I think I'm ready to die. Like, like so I don't want to undermine whatever is behind this it is powerful. And, and a lot of it operates out of fear. Okay. First Kings 21. We see Jezebel again, and we see some of like how, how the, those who operate in the spirit of Jezebel. Like, There's a man by the name of Naboth who owned a field next to Ahab's palace. And Ahab saw that field, and he's like, I'd love to have that field for my own community garden. Slight paraphrase on my part, but he wanted a garden. So he goes over to Naboth, I love your field, I'll pay you good money, top dollar, I want, this will be great, I want to have a garden right here, can I buy your field from you? And Naboth said no. And he claimed the Levitical law from the Old Testament about the inheritance of land being passed on to generation to generation. And so Ahab, oh, he got sad. He went back into the palace. And if I may, my, he threw a hissy fit. I'm the king. Naboth wouldn't sell me his land. And Jezebel's like, what is wrong with you? Why are you walking around here pouting? You're the king. And he's like, Naboth won't give me the land. And she's like, you're the king. Nobody tells you what to do. She immediately, watch this, she worked through deception. She falsely accused Naboth, and then she had him put to death. 
And then if that wasn't enough to erase the Levitical law of land being handed to the inheritance for generations, every one of his sons were killed. And she said, here you go. There's your land. You wanted it. It was literally that simple. So it's important to know <laughs> that in this way, we see the spirit of Jezebel or the operating in the spirit of Jezebel exercising the desire to get whatever it wants, no matter what the cost, even destroying lives in the process. Do you see that? And so Jesus is saying to the church at Thyatira, you sort of put all this together, like you're tolerating this woman and her teaching and, and through silencing the voice of God, giving false prophets of, uh, pro prophecies of God, being seductive, people are believing and being led astray into false worship and to sexual immorality. And, I, and you're tolerating it. You're letting it go on within the church is what Jesus says to them. The name Jezebel eventually becomes synonymous with seduction, idolatry, power, control, and death. And I would say, for whatever it's worth, my own personal opinion this type of spirit, not exclusively, but in whole scale ways, attacks leadership within the church. And it goes after a particular leader, listen, and it uses hurt, wounded people to be a mouthpiece for the Jezebel spirit or the spirit of Jezebel. So we got to be cautious and careful that that spirit is not allowed in this body and that we don't allow ourselves to become that because it's, it's seducing, it's seductive. So verse 21, this is fascinating to me. Like, look at what Jesus says. I have given her time. Like she's had time to repent. So even in this, Jesus is like, I'm so loving. I'm so gracious. I've not exercised judgment yet because I am extending grace and mercy to her to repent of her sin what a wonderful picture of how Jesus continues to deal with us. Even when we tolerate sin in our own lives, Jesus will deal with it, we know. And he's ultimately dealt with it, right? Eternally through his death on the cross. But in context, in the moment, with consequences even, he's like, I'm giving you time to repent. And maybe that's a word for some of us today. There's some idolatry. There's some sexual immorality. You've, you've become a mouthpiece. You're harboring thoughts against individuals, leadership within a ministry, leadership within the church. And that Jezebel spirit wants to come into that fertile ground and mess you up and mess the church up. Jesus is like, I'm giving you time to repent. That's how good I am. Even in judgment, I'm gracious and I am loving. And I just think that's so beautiful. Uh, he says, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Verse 22, I sort of title this a verse, Jesus, don't play. At the end of the day, here's what Jesus says. Remember, he's the righteous judge. He's got the bronzed feet and the discerning eyes. So when he passes judgment, it's absolutely clean, it's absolutely pure, and it's 100% fair based upon his standard. We have to remember that, okay? So he says this. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless, once again, look, unless they repent. So even, even in judgment, man, Jesus just gets such a bad picture sometimes. He is righteous. As a righteous judge, he has to judge righteously. But even in judgment, there is grace and there is mercy and there is opportunity for his people to repent. Thank you, Jesus. I, I'm thankful for that. I need this. I hope you recognize that as well, too. Mm. She's going to suffer. Her followers are going to experience the same thing unless they repent. I just came across this quote in regards to the church and to the Jezebel spirit. Like, the church is meant to be an embassy of heaven, but Jezebel was an ambassador for hell. Subtle. Powerful. She seduced a lot of people. I think she seduced a lot of good people in the church. But make no doubt about it where she was from. The description of the judgment... Um, we see there that Jesus just talks about, I'll strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Um, it is interesting that Jesus talks about the impact this will have on all the churches. And that he's going to show all the churches. And by way of this being recorded in scripture, he continues to show the churches today. That he's full of grace and mercy and gives time for repentance. But at the end of the day, he will judge sin. He will judge sin in his church, period. Because Jesus wants a pure bride. 
And it's not because he's angry or hates the church. It's because he loves his church. And he wants the best for his church. And he cares so deeply about his bride. That's why he does this. And then the admonition in verses 24 and 25. Uh, what does Jesus say? It, notice this is fascinating to me. What does Jesus ask these people to do in light? You're tolerating. The spirit is, is corrupted. It's in your church. What does he tell them to do? Notice this. The one thing Jesus tells them to do is to hold on to their faith. In verses 24 and 25, that's what he tells them to do. Those of you that have not, taught, not given in and not fought, stay true. Hold fast. Don't give in. Now notice this. Jesus never asked or commanded the Thyatira tyrants to do anything about Jezebel and her followers. I just find that fascinating. Now, I'm not saying this is a, um, a prescription and we don't deal with things in the church. But in this particular instance, and, and I think there's a reason why, all he told them was to watch what he was going to do and how he was going to deal with it. If you're paying attention, what did he say? I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery to suffer with her. I will strike her children or just cut off her lineage from influence in this church. Jesus said, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to deal with I'm going to deal with this Jezebel woman. I'm going to deal with the spirit behind her. I'm going to deal with the influence and the impact she's having in my church. Here's an analogy maybe to help us understand in this particular instance, right? Like a husband protecting his bride when and if someone comes in courting her. Trying to seduce her and lure her away from her affection for him. Jesus is going to protect his bride. Amen. Thank you. And he will deal with the temptress himself. That doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to keep our guard up and to stand firm. That doesn't mean there's plenty of other portions in scripture where church leadership is called to deal with things and we're called to protect the unity of the spirit. But I think the analogy that we see here is Jesus is like, I love my bride so much and this spirit is so deeply entrenched and so strong and so powerful. I'm going to step in and I'm going to protect my bride and I'm going to deal with the seducing spirit because I love my bride. And that's the message I want you to hear. It's because he loves his bride, which means he loves you, church. He loves me, church, enough to protect me and enough to deal with things that would lure my attention and my affection away from Jesus. Thank you, God, that you do that. And you just, just let me walk down this path without calling me back, without being willing to come in and deal with the things that are mine. And then finally, verses 26 to 29, you see the common phrase, to the one who is victorious, not to the one who never stumbles, not to the one who will sin, because we know we will sin, but at the end of the day, we persevere, and when we sin, we confess, we repent, we get back up, and we keep moving on as the bride of Christ, and we keep pursuing intimacy with Jesus, and we do it until our last dying breath here and our first time in eternity, and Jesus said, you are victorious because you follow the victorious king up until your last breath. May that be a mark and a legacy of the people of God and of the church of God that we are victorious unto the end. Hallelujah. That's what he says. And then he just, and he says, that being the case, now remember prophetic literature. Now let me speak real quick to the millennial kingdom. When I come and establish my kingdom, like those who are faithful to the end, you get to rule and reign with me. You get to rule and reign with me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What's our call to action in this? I think it's simple, right? Again, we say focused on the love that Jesus has for his bride, the care that he has for her, the call that he has for her of a pure bride, a heart and our motivation to continue doing deeds, works of service, pursuing him in our relationship and intimacy with him. But at the end of the day, here's what I would ask each of us to do in response to today's letter to Thyatira in preparation for the communion. Ask this, prayerfully consider this. Are there any areas 
where I am tolerating sin in my life. It may be outward sin. It may be an inward spirit. Unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, hate, rage, anger, betrayal. Outward, sexual immorality, idolatry, idols in the heart. I, I think that's our call to action. Because at the end of the day, that's what Jesus was saying. You've, you've tolerated it. You're doing some great stuff, and I see it. Keep doing those, but you can't tolerate anymore. 